Good afternoon to all of you. And it is my privilege and pleasure to be with all of you this afternoon. I express my appreciation to the organizers for their effort on such a vitally important issue. I thought it best that I speak on what I consider a critically important component in sustainability management, which is our personal responsibility as citizens. So I will speak on simple, actionable sustainability for the ordinary Indian, for you and me. Next slide, please. Discussions around green transformations, how to make economies and societies sustainable. Can you go to the next uh, slide? I think there's a, uh, yes. Discussions around green transformations, how to make economies and societies sustainable are at the forefront of global, national and local political agendas. I will begin with a peek at global sustainability strategies that are making the news today. In Sweden, public-private collaboration has resulted in the IT system Kato that makes use of advanced algorithms to operate railway traffic as energy efficiently as possible. Go back to the previous slide. Here is a picture of vertical farming and urban orchards. Current estimates suggest that by 2050, the world will be inhabited by 9 billion people, 80% of whom will live in cities. To some extent, urban farming will have to happen. We see this as decorative farming today in our buildings. But if done smartly, it could revolutionize the way we view food production and create a local food movement for the urbanite. Mixed use skyscrapers are the, are the perfect example of a smart city concept, putting those tall glass buildings to good use as greenhouses. But at ground level too, mixed use parks and urban orchards could begin to provide food for the masses. Think it couldn't happen? It already did. During World War II, the Dig for Victory campaign saw formal gardens and parks turned into allotments, producing millions of tons of food and effectively defeating German blockades. Next slide, please. Next, yes. There are also initiatives happening closer home. More than 1 million Bangladeshis could be displaced by rising sea levels by 2050. One consequence is that children cannot attend schools for long periods of time, making it harder for them to escape poverty. By building a fleet of solar powered school boats, the Bangladeshi initiative, Sid Sidhulai Swarnivar Sangstha, has secured year-round education in flood-prone regions of Bangladesh. Each floating boat school collects students from different riverside villages, ultimately docking at the last destination where on-board classes begin. Solar lighting makes the schedule flexible which provides for additional educational programs in the evening. Shidulai's floating schools model has been replicated in Nigeria, Cambodia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Zambia. Oh. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what do these pictures tell us? All over the world, change is happening from fossil fuel to renewable energy and from throwaway to circular economy. It is no surprise then that sustainability is the stuff of conferences. We can declaim about sustainability from a podium and go back home satisfied of a job well done. But if you are having tea during the break, 
and I come to you and say, let us talk about sustainability, what will you do? You will discreetly move away or at least mentally switch off with a muttered AKF as gay AR. This is exactly the problem. What does sustainability mean to you, to me? This is a question that no one ever bothers to answer. We live most of our life blissfully unaware and sheltered from the environmental crisis that our planet is fa facing. Even if we do learn something about it, the problem seems so complex and overwhelming that we give up before we start. Unless and until in one life-changing moment, the enormous importance of it all hits us suddenly. For me, this life-changing moment came when I sat, just like you are sitting now, as part of a small select audience and listened to Jeffrey Sachs, the economist turned idealist and director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Jeffrey spoke beautifully, convincingly, he demonstrated without doubt how great is the crisis facing the earth. But I was not completely convinced. And so I dared to ask Jeffrey Sachs, why should this be important for me? I'm struggling with my daily life, my daily problems. Why should I care? And anyway, what can I, a small lone individual, what can I do? Why should I be my brother's keeper? The measure of a great man's greatness is how he addresses the little man or the little woman in this case. Jeffrey Sachs's greatness came through in that instance. He embraced, yes, that's the word, embraced my question, acknowledged the essential moral nature of sustainability, the responsibility it places on each of us, and then laughed that while he could give macro level speeches, he was rather less enthusiastic about recycling in his own home. Next slide, please. So that is the key note I am going to address today. What is my role, your role, the role of each of us in sustainability? What are the things we can do and should do? We Indians bemoan our collective lack of civic sense while simultaneously pardoning our own. This has led to a pervasive hypocrisy in our public discourse, not only on this issue, but in all larger issues. I hope that at the end of the next 10 or 15 minutes, sustainability becomes for all of us a subject of our actionable present, not just a doomsday prospect of a common gloomy future. First, stop, breathe, relax, don't panic. The pralayam, the disaster, may be imminent, but this is a matter for rational action, not fear. Real change and beneficial change takes some time. Second, educate yourself. Read everything that you can. Watch documentaries. Enroll in courses at college or online like Coursera. A lot of stuff goes on in the name of climate science. You will never go wrong if you diligently question the world around you and educate yourself. Information today is available in plenty. The trick is to access and internalize that which is simple, real, and actionable. Third, do. There are so many simple things that one can do without being overawed by labels. 
recycling, for instance. It is ironic that we frugal Indians have to learn about recycling from the opulently wasteful Americans. Why, my grandmother, who used to make rasais from her old used saris, could teach us all a thing or two about recycling. So many of us cousins grew up wrapped in the warmth of her love, as also her red bandhani covered padded quilts. I am sure we can't all go back to quilting. But we also cannot rely on Western solutions because it is either unsuitable to our lifestyle or redundant simply because we are already a careful people. What is the point if we are cautioned against buying a third car when we don't even own one? So it is left to us Indians to evolve our own methods customized to our context. And there are so many things that we can do. In a buffet or a wedding meal, just help yourself to what you will eat instead of heaping your plate and wasting the rest. Switch off appliances and lights when not in use. Take a longer reusable bag for your grocery shopping instead of asking for one more plastic or even a paper bag. Use buckets and mugs instead of allowing India's rivers to flow into your drains. Grow a small garden. Reduce your garbage, segregate it, and above all, don't pile it in your neighbor's empty backyard. I am sure each of you will be able to come up with many things that we can do. When I speak of action, there are certain caveats I would like to make. Be realistic. Start with yourself. Assess where you are and how you can change. Many sustainability converts become overenthusiastic, trying to change those around them, but become frustrated and stop when the others don't come along. In fact, a good way to go is to first formulate exactly how you want others to behave and then behave exactly that way yourself. The first steps are local. Look at your own usage and make smart changes. If you lived in Rome or Montreal, I would suggest that you walk to work. But here it is not really feasible most of the time. So start with doable changes, then work your way to the bigger ones. Or you can segment your efforts into personal actions, local actions, and national actions, and steadily augment your effort. As you know more, you will do more, and then you can expand and intensify your effort. You can invest in a cleaner car or a greener res residence, there is really no end to the things that you can do and will do when you get interested. Finally, there will certainly come a time when you will become a messenger. At that time, tell a compelling story, make it personal and relate it directly to the individual so that your audience will care. I think part of our problem is that we still use the old approaches of the traditional environmental movement, using negative reinforcement, lobbying vague threats, focusing on all that stands to be lost. If it is going to survive, the sustainability movement needs to do just the opposite. Paint a picture of how good things could be. Talk about all the great things that we will achieve, not all the bad things we will avoid. And inspire people to change instead of trying, trying to scare them. Next slide, please. At the end of today, I am certain that you will go back wiser, more knowledgeable, perhaps more fearful. There are different frameworks, 
the crisis frame, the controversy frame, the social responsibility frame, the morality frame, the political frame. I have no doubt that all of you have been enriched by the discussion. I have only this to add. Sustainability is not someone else's problem. It is mine, it is yours and all of ours. But, if you, but you don't need me to say this. You know it already. Gandhiji said a long time ago that the earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not every man's greed. The Mahatma, as usual, has summed it better than any of us could ever do. With these closing words, I wish your discussion all success. Thank you all very much. Jai.